So welcome everybody. My name is Paula Price. I'm with the People's Law School and today's webinar is Best Practices for Public Legal Information. Creating information that people tr trust, understand, and use. And before we leap into the substance of today's webinar, we just like to get a sense of who we have joining us today. So there will be a poll that comes up and we would ask that you complete um, the, the, the questions based on what best describes you. So uh, public e legal information practitioner at a not-for-profit organization, maybe you're a decision maker at a not-for-profit organization, maybe you're a legal professional, a lawyer, um, a, a notary, a legal advocate who produces public legal information as part of their practice, uh, maybe you're interested in communicating clearly in your work or none of the above, but you're interested in the topic. And as we let that poll run for a minute, I'd just like to let you know that there will be a recording of this webinar um, that will be sent to all registrants. And so um, you can look for that in your inbox. <clears throat> and I think that we will close the poll out and get a sense of who we have. So it looks like... Um, about half of our uh, attendees today are uh, writing and producing public legal information at a not-for-profit, uh, 43%. And next we have interested in communicating clearly in your work, excellent. Um, legal professionals, none of the above, and decision makers. So that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and welcome. We're so glad to have you here with us today. And I see we've got 132 participants on the line right now. So welcome everybody. Now this uh, webinar today is for producers of public legal information who want to know where and how to invest their resources to create information that people trust, understand, and use. What you can expect today is we've got, um, first of all, a 60-minute webinar where we'll start out with a presentation, we'll talk about what the best practices are, how they were developed, um, and what they mean for you. Then we'll follow on with a live question section near the end. Um, at four o'clock, we'll be turning into an optional workshop, and that's a 30-minute add-on, where we'll be walking you through an online assessment that you can use to assess uh, how your public legal information measures in relation to the best practices. We invite you to provide us with your questions and with your comments. So as we go through the webinar, you can use the Q&A function on your toolbar to ask questions. Um, if you see questions that you like, then I would encourage you to do the thumbs up, um, click on that button, and that will promote the question to the top of the pile. And that means that we will, it's the first one that we see when we turn to the live Q&A. Um, if you would like to chat, feel free to add your comments in the chat function. And um, we would like to acknowledge that the team, uh, the, the team um, that, is, that, is, that we are presenting, uh, acknowledges that the land on which we are gathered is the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And that includes the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'll turn it over to Patricia Byrne, the Executive Director of the People's Law School, uh, to make further acknowledgements. But before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge Patricia myself um, as the leader of, um, of our team at People's. And she has been um, such a great leader in terms of direction and support in our, um, in our webinar initiatives. And it's building on a stream of webinars that we've been producing, particularly in response to to um, what's been happening with the coronavirus pandemic. And it's um, from that platform that we've really been able to reach people and extend our reach today. So um, we're delighted to have so many people join us. And, um, and, I, and I would just like to acknowledge the role that Patricia's played in that. So with that, Patricia, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Those are such nice words. And folks, this was entirely not planned. <laughs> she didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you today uh, for our webinar on best practices for public legal information. As Paula said, I'm Patricia Byrne, Executive Director of People's Law School. Um, you've met Paula Price, our moderator today. And joining Paula on this webinar team are Drew Jackson and David Candestin. 
I'll give you a fuller introduction to our team in a moment, but uh, first a word about People's Law School. We are a not-for-profit organization based in Vancouver, British Columbia. We provide free information to help British Columbians deal with legal problems of daily life. We do this primarily through our two principal websites, peopleslawschool.ca and dialalaw.ca. And we do this through education sessions, in person, in normal times, and through webinars. People's Law School is one of several organizations who, over the past four years, have collaborated as a committee to develop best practices and tools to help everyone who produces legal information resources for the public. Our colleagues in this initiative um, include Legal Aid BC, Justice Education Society, and Courthouse Libraries BC, with the ongoing support of the Law Foundation of British Columbia. About our webinar team, Drew, Paula, and David are each lawyers at People's Law School. They bring a wealth of talent in terms of their legal expertise and, equally important, their ability to make complex information, like legal information, understandable. As mentioned, Paula is moderating today. David will be answering questions that you send us via Q&A. And Drew is our principal speaker. And it's totally appropriate for Drew to take us through best practices today because he has been coordinating our best practices uh, stakeholder committee over the years and knows more about this topic than almost anyone else. So Drew, I turn it over to you to give us some insight on how we can make better public legal information resources. Well, what a lovely intro. Thank you for that, Patricia, and delighted to be here. Uh, as part of People's Law School and the collaborative effort, as Patricia highlighted, so many agencies have been part of building out these best practices that we're here to share with everybody today. Thank you so much, Patricia, and thank you and welcome, Drew. Uh, we're really excited to have you here today, Drew, to, um, to walk us through, to, to tell us what these best practices are and, and to explain them in, as everyone can see from the slide, um, you are a justice consultant, access to justice consultant and the legal content developer for People's Law School. And um, I'd just like to add that you have a talent for uh, using technology to make information accessible and um, really excited to have you here today. So Drew, we're going to jump in and ask uh, a starter question. What is public legal information? Yeah, so <clears throat> public legal information in a nutshell is legal information primarily aimed at the public and has had actually a long history uh, over the 50 plus years of intensive effort by sole purpose agencies that do just public legal information and a wide array of other agencies and folks who do some public legal information. And so delighted that so many uh, such a broad mix of folks can join us here today who participate in public legal information in, in various ways, from government to nonprofits uh, to, to law firms and, and others. Wonderful, One thing um, just to, to, to round out that I always like to flag is that public legal information is part of the access to justice movement. It's a piece of the puzzle of helping people navigate and access justice. Uh, and we'll talk a bit as we go through around where public legal information fits into the mix of, of different supports for people as they go about trying to access justice. Excellent. Thank you so much, Drew. Um, and, and the reason that we're all here today is, is these best practices. So why were the best practices developed? Indeed. So there's a real paradox around information and access to justice. So here on the screen, we've got Justice Thomas Cromwell, who chaired the seminal uh, report on access to justice in civil and family matters in 2013, the Action Committee's work that is so influential in access to justice initiatives. And a couple of quotes here that he highlights uh, I think show the, the paradox. On the one hand, as his first quote highlights, we need, he said in the report, to provide those who experience legal problems with information and resources to deal with them in an efficient and effective way. In other words, 
information is part of the solution to access to justice. There's obviously many other pieces, but part of the solution. On the other hand, there is an overwhelming amount of information. And it's, as, as the report noted, it's not always clear to the user what information is authoritative or current or reliable. So this is, is the paradox. On the one hand, you've got more access than ever to information with the internet, providing abundant information access. But on the other, there's actually research that shows with more choice, people have a harder time to decide. And so in this space that we work in, people have a harder time to decide what is trustworthy, what is relevant. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> uh, one of the um, concepts that we've come to learn through this best practices work over the last couple of years is that the psychologists have a term for this and it's called choice overload. And it's the idea of having too many approximately equal good options and it's mentally draining. People have a hard time deciding. And so with the internet, uh, that's just amplified that challenge. And as a result of that challenge, people take shortcuts. They look for cues that suggest to them that something is trustworthy or something is good quality. And what this best practices initiative has been about is looking at those cues, those shortcuts in the context of legal information aimed at the public and the best practices distill those shortcuts and cues into a set of best practices for developing public legal information that help people uh, uh, identify cues from the information to come to the decision more quickly. Hey, this stuff looks trustworthy, looks reliable. I'm going to use it and it'll have an impact on my situation. Interesting. So you're saying that the best practices are really guidelines to help um, almost uh, take a shortcut to what to have the most impact and reach for individuals who are looking for answers to their problems. Totally. And in fact, the, the ultimate purpose of the best practice is indeed to help information producers make legal information that their audience trusts, understands, and uses. And so what we're trying to do really is bridge two things that are in play. On the one hand, you've got the challenge that the user experiences looking for information that I've talked a bit about around figuring out what is trustworthy, what is relevant amongst this um, huge mass of information available. And on the other hand, you've got the, the challenges of the information producer who, who struggles in different ways around trying to figure out what they should focus on in producing information. What is gonna make the biggest difference in terms of helping people understand, well, initially even find, uh, identify their information as being potentially useful and then engage with it, understand it, and put it to use, which is the ultimate end that we're all seeking is to have an impact on people. So the best practices are trying to offer a bridge between the challenge the user experiences, finding information and, and understanding it on the one hand, and the challenge for the information producer on figuring out where to focus their energies and how to get seek out resources that will allow them to develop information that has the, the most impact. So the practices are trying to provide a framework for the information producer while also supporting the end user in finding and, and understanding and putting to use information. Thank you, Drew. And, and I understand that this is an initiative that started years ago. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you came about developing those best practices? Yeah, so it was absolutely a collaborative effort. Uh, it sparked initially in a few different ways, but one of the sparks was by uh, the Law Foundation of BC uh, that the Board of Governors table, as I understand it, there was uh, some recognition through reports and research on, on access to justice through the mid 2010s, that access to justice report that I referred to in 2013 and also the CBABC had a seminal report uh, and others. And one of the themes emerging was this idea that people struggle with 
finding information that is relevant to their situation. And so at the governor's table, uh, I gather there was discussion about could a mark or a seal uh, help people that was placed on information that was good quality information. And that sparked, that was among the sparks for work uh, that a committee uh, sponsored by the Law Foundation of BC and made up of the agencies that Patricia uh, mentioned has been meeting over a four year period now, believe it or not. Uh, so it's been a, quite a journey, um, but there was initially work to develop uh, best practices um, and really dig in to uh, the experience people have. So we actually did extensive testing with the public directly on how they look for information, what kind of cues they look for in legal information. And then we also looked closely at the research on broader information seeking patterns and strategies that people bring. And we learned uh, some cool things about uh, uh, one term we learned was cognitive heuristics and not to throw in too much jargon, but it's the idea that uh, I mentioned a bit earlier around shortcuts is that those are heuristics are cues that people look for to, to gain confidence or make decisions quickly on what might be relevant for them. And one of the things that is really interesting about cognitive heuristics, these shortcuts, uh, and an example of a shortcut would be people look for uh, some kind of indicator of who's behind information, the source of information, like a shortcut to that, and how much expertise they bring. And one of the things that's really striking from the research on cognitive heuristics is that they help people make decisions that are actually really good decisions. So they're shortcuts, but they're not, they're not bad shortcuts. They can actually be very, very powerful and effective shortcuts. So we looked at that uh, and we looked at work being done by others. And one of the really interesting things in this landscape is that our efforts here in BC were not the only efforts in, in, in play over the last few years. There's a really great initiative that's been unfolding in Ontario led by our, our friends and colleagues at Community Legal Education Ontario, CLEO, and I know some of them are on, on the broadcast today, which is so cool. And they've developed uh, with input from folks in Ontario, uh, an extensive effort there, a set of public legal information guidelines, as they call them. And we shared information back and forth over the last few years as we developed our best practices here in BC, and as they developed their guidelines in Ontario and learned from each other and brought them into quite close alignment. And I'll talk a bit more, I think, at a later point when we get into the, the meat of the, the practices themselves about some of the things we learned there. Uh, but the end result was the set of best practices and then flowing from that, this quality mark that is another piece of the puzzle uh, for what we're, we're effectively launching with this webinar and super excited about that. Excellent. And, and I understand we're going to be taking a, a, a closer look at some of these best practices that you were talking about, these um, that, that fit into the shortcuts. <clears throat> but the quality mark that you just mentioned, um, would you tell us a bit more about what that is? Yeah, so this is brand new. We're, we're literally launching this today. And it's a, a second wave of work that the committee involved in this uh, best practices work has been working on over the last year or so. And it picks up on this challenge of how people cope with information overload and how they look for cues for relevance and trustworthiness. And so we had originally done some early testing with the public three years ago as we first had an early draft of the best practices and we were testing with the public directly some of the concepts in the best practices. And we took that opportunity to do a, an initial round of testing of a, of a mark. At the time we were calling it a mark of excellence. And the testing revealed that people really responded to that. Uh, 19 out of the 20 people we tested with, and it wasn't meant to be like a, a quantitative um, statistically accurate sample. It was, it was a qualitative set of testing, trying to get um, indications of what people pay attention to 
in assessing public legal information. But still, it was 19 out of 20 of the testers felt that the mark significantly influenced their assessment around whether or not the information was trustworthy and relevant. And so that sparked a next wave of work to work directly with the public to develop the quality mark that is on the screen here now. And the idea is that it signals that public legal information is trustworthy and relevant. And we'll talk a little bit here about how someone can go, can go about qualifying to use the quality mark. But the idea from the end user perspective is that it's, it's a shortcut, a cue, that information has been developed uh, with the, public's, uh, the public top of mind and with practices that support the information in being understandable and uh, information that the public can put to use uh, and have an impact on their situation. It's wonderful. So taking it uh, a step back, the best practices themselves are built on some of the signals that, that will inspire trust. Um, and then the mark itself, which you qualify for if you follow those practices, is then a further reinforcement of that trust. So what, does, um, what do you need to do in order to qualify for the quality mark? Totally. So for a legal information provider to qualify, uh, they need to produce legal information that is primarily intended for use by the public in British Columbia, and that is free. Uh, so those are kind of the building blocks. And then there is a self-assessment that we have available on the Better Legal Information website. The website address is on the screen, betterlegalinfo.ca. And that self-assessment has eight questions. They're aligned with the eight high impact best practices, which we'll unpack in a little bit here. Uh, and each practice, each best practice has a question that is assessing the degree to which the information follows that best practice. And for information that substantially follows the best practices. Uh, we'll get into a bit uh, uh, more on the scoring in the workshop after the optional workshop uh, after the one hour webinar here for anyone who wants to, to do a deep dive. We'll run through the self-assessment on the screen and go into how the scoring needs to be at least 12 out of 16 points. So call it three quarter score, 75%. Uh, back in the day, um, it was about how I performed when I was in in, in school most of the time. Um, and that's the minimum score needed to qualify to use the quality mark. And then there's a commitment made by the information producer as part of that process of completing the self-assessment to commit to applying the public league information best practices to their information to the best of their ability. And from that point, they get access to a set of fo downloadable files that they can use on their information in a couple of different flavors. There's a a landscape uh, uh, size and a, or orientation, if you will, and, and a portrait one for use in different types of materials or, or web pages. Excellent. And, and as Drew uh, just mentioned, this is going to be the, um, the main focus of the workshop is taking the online assessment tool and going through the eight steps to, um, to effectively measure how a piece of legal information compares and whether it qualifies for that mark. And with that, Drew, um, we have these eight high impact best practices and we're gonna go through each of them. So uh, let's just start with the first, say who made the information. Yeah, so with our own research uh, into how the public responds to different uh, presentations of legal information. Because uh, what we did in our, in our end user testing with the public is we would present them with the same information but with slightly different treatments that would either indicate the source or the date or that it had been legally reviewed or not. And then we would ask them questions about it um, have them try to navigate through a, a scenario using the information to see how well they could actually apply the information with different 
treatments. And as we did our own testing of that type, and then also the broader literature into, into, into how people assess credibility of information, including online credibility, source stands out as the number one thing. It's by no means the only thing, but it is huge in terms of people uh, developing a sense of trust in information, who is behind the information. And so our number one best practice is, is to say who made the information and to make it easy to see. So I think we've got an example we can uh, share with folks. So here on the screen now is a screenshot of the Family Law in BC website from Legal Aid BC. And they, I, I think, do a really nice job with this best practice where, as we are highlighting on the screen, they're saying the name of the organization. They're even in the, in the pop-up there that, that makes it a bit more readable what is circled. Um, indicating that their organization is actually in the process of a name change uh, over into Legal Aid BC from Legal Services Society. And then a second thing they're doing that we found to be really important is they're explaining briefly why they're trustworthy. So people don't want to read a big long explanation of why someone is trustworthy, but they really get a lot of value out of something very short and concise that explains why this information provider is trustworthy. So I think this example from Legal Services Society where they're, they're offering a couple of paragraphs, or sorry, a couple of sentences on why they're trustworthy uh, does a really nice job of this. And then the third thing indicated in yellow here on the screen, including contact information, is also really important in terms of helping people um, provide feedback uh, and engage with um, uh, the information provider. And I'll mention that these three things that are highlighted in yellow on the screen, saying the name of the organization, explaining why you're trustworthy, and including contact information, these are what we call, what we're calling indicators. And each of the eight high impact best practices has between two and seven indicators, which are features that show that they're following the best practice. So these are the three indicators here for the first best practice, say who made the information. And the, the um, self-assessment looks at, have you, is your information demonstrating more than half of the indicators? So you don't have to get them all, but in this case, two out of three is more than half. And so having two of the three indicators means you're following this first best practice on saying who made the information. Yeah. And I think that information is really helpful and useful to somebody who is creating legal information and they are wanting to evaluate um, how to make it, for example, say who made the information, that's one category, but then you've listed out each of these indicators so people know um, what to include in their information um, specifically. And just to recap then, Drew, um, of the different best practices, you're saying that this particular one, who made the information, um, is it, am I right in thinking that's, that's the most persuasive uh, of the indicators? Or sorry, of the best practices? I mean, it's sort of hard to, to be too strong with this. It's sort of like, you know, your children, you don't want to say that um, child number one is, is the, the one. They're all important. And in fact, that, that's, I think, an important message. We, we, we have a total of 16 best practices, and we have them in two clusters, eight high impact and eight additional helpful practices. They're all important. We wouldn't include them if we didn't think they were important. Um, that said, if, there, if, we, if we had to pick one that had the most influence on the, degree, the way people decide on whether information is trustworthy uh, or relevant, then source does stand out. Excellent, thank you. And you're moving to the second of the eight um, high impact practices, say where the information applies. Yeah, so this is huge. Uh, in the digital age more than ever, with information being truly uh, global, information really doesn't know borders. Uh, well, it, Google sort of tries, like if I, if I now tr type in to, to, um, to Google restaurants near me, 
it does a pretty good job at figuring out which restaurants are near me and, and doesn't give me restaurants from Los Angeles. But um, no one goes problems with the used car near me. Like that's not a search that people do. And Google can't figure that out on its own that well. It does a bit of a job on that in terms of looking at the IP address of the person searching and where the information is located, but it's, it's a rough match at best. So taking that example, when I search on Google for problems with a used car, uh, in my top 10 results, five of them are from outside British Columbia. They're from other provinces or from the US. Five of them are from BC, so I can kind of make my way, but still, uh, it's so important to say where the information applies because of that challenge that people are landing on information ever in just a moment uh, that they make that assessment about is this information relevant for me and you know I'm, I'm dealing with a problem in British Columbia and to say that in a clear way is so important. So I think we have an example of that here that we can offer and so this Example now on the screen is the Tenant Survival Guide, which is available in multiple formats from the Tenant Resource and Advisory Center, one of which is as a ClickLaw Wiki book, which is hosted by Courthouse Libraries, BC, one of the collaborating agencies involving, involved in developing the best practices, and a shout out to Courthouse Libraries, where I used to work, but nonetheless, this part isn't related to that. It's that they did some really important work about five years ago in starting to develop uh, guidelines for legal information that was online that was one of the sparks for the work that this committee then really rolled up their sleeves collectively and picked up on. So um, uh, thank you for that, Cordes Libraries. And so here, though on the screen, is uh, the, the ClickLaw Wikibook platform uh, version of the Tenant Survival Guide, and they've done a nice job, I think, saying right up front, uh, right below the title of the section of the guide, uh, the information applies in British Columbia. So two, two of the key indicators for this best practice are say the jurisdiction and make it easy to see. And they've done, I think, both in this example. I'm a big fan, personally, of putting Canada in there as well, because uh, for, for folks who are elsewhere, um, British Columbia, not, not immediately obvious necessarily. Uh, and uh, I just think it, it, it uh, is a nice additional touch personally. So um, cool that uh, Cordes Libraries is doing that with the Click Live Wikibook platform as well. Excellent. Thank you, Drew. So moving into the next uh, best practice, we have reviewed the information for legal accuracy and say you've done so. Yeah, so this one is huge as well. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the, there's actually four here, and they're the first four, we're on number three now, that, that do stand out above um, the others in terms of, of, of a higher level of impact on people building a sense of trustworthiness. And, and that information is relevant. And this one around uh, telling folks, well, first of all, doing a legal review of the information, and then very importantly, telling folks that you've done that is, is super important. In our testing with the public, this was one of the things that we were really struck by is we, we kind of thought this might be important, but wow, it was really, really notable how, uh, different treatments of a legal review had a different impact on testers. So we, we tr did the very same information with just reviewed for legal accuracy, just a statement, nothing else. And then we had an, a second treatment that was uh, indicating the name of a lawyer or a legal professional, someone with uh, subject matter expertise who did the legal review. So reviewed for legal accuracy by Paula Price. Uh, and then we had a third one that had a headshot and a firm affiliation and a fourth one that had 
all of that plus a, a link to a short bio giving the credentials of the reviewer. And it was truly striking how each level up increased the trustworthiness for testers uh, in terms of the, the sense of trustworthiness they had in the information. So this to, to me is a really critical best practice. And I think we've got an example we can share. Uh, so this is what at People's Law School, where we took over operation of the dial law service uh, a bit over a year ago from the Canadian Bar Association, BC branch. And in, in uh, refreshing the dial law website, we were picking up on a number of themes we learned about in the best practices work and the testing with the public. And so we convey that we legally reviewed this information and the date, and we'll talk about the date in the, in the next best practice. And we also uh, put in a prominent kind of color that, that this information has been reviewed for legal accuracy by, and then the name of the lawyer, a headshot, uh, their affiliation, and a link to that uh, law lawyer's uh, law firm, or in this case, the College of Physicians and Surgeons. And that approach tested really well with, with uh, testing that we did separately at People's Law School to better understand how our implementation of some of these practices was playing out for, for the public. Excellent, thank you, Drew. And moving into the next uh, best practice, we have include the date of the last legal review. Yeah, so this, this is also important. Um, uh, uh, currency, um, it, it, some really interesting learning here for the committee and, and the testing we did. Um, one thing that we were wrestling with is the degree to which people with online information assume that whatever they're looking at online is current. And we had a hypothesis that they do. In other words, that, that generally speaking, people assume that whatever they find online is current. And, and that wasn't really borne out in our testing that fully. You know, little examples of it for, for sure. But a lot of testers were alive to the idea that with legal information, uh, they couldn't make that assumption, that, that they, they had a, a sense that, that there would be more involved in putting accurate legal information online that couldn't just be up to date to yesterday. Uh, it's not like a, a news site or something of that nature. So that, that was an interesting um, piece to this. But without a doubt, understanding when information was current to was really important for, for folks that we tested with. Um, and just generally a best practice from the point of view of helping people understand what kind of gap they need to fill if they're to be truly confident they've got up-to-date information. In other words, saying, um, as we saw on the last screen, March 2019, okay, now the user knows they've got a bit, a bit over a year to top up uh, if they want to be absolutely assured they've got the current, most current information. So why don't we look at an example of this one, uh, Paula. So here we've got the uh, Disability Alliance BC produces a series of help sheets on disability benefits for <clears throat> in, in British Columbia. And they do a nice job, I think, at indicating the currency date with, with a date right in a prominent spot on, on the front page of the help sheet. Um, they provide a more detailed date down below. It's a little small on the screen, but right at the bottom, it's April 23rd, 2019, so a real pinpoint date. And they do another thing that we have as an indicator uh, for this best practice, which is to explain the importance of the currency date. And again, concisely, not at great length, it's just like a really short statement about um, why the date is important. And so down um, in, in the footer there of the first page of this help sheet, I think they've done a nice job with that. Excellent. Um, Andrew, we're gonna move into the next four and we might um, move a little bit more quickly through these ones just so we can save a bit of time for Q&A at the end of this portion of the webinar. So number five, we've got um, say who or what the information is for. 
Yeah, so it's, this best practice is about identifying your audience, <clears throat> which is such a key aspect of making your information engaging and understandable and more likely to be used. So why don't we jump right into the example here, Paula, and here we've got a website from Justice Education Society uh, of BC, which is another one of the, the groups that was uh, at the table throughout the, the committee process developing these best practices. And here on their Families Change website, I think they do a really nice job of this best practice where they've identified the audience and the purpose of the information. And so down below in the three uh, sort of call outs for parents, teens and kids, they go another step further at explaining the purpose of the information for each of those three audience segments. So a very nice job right on the homepage of that website in handling that best practice. Excellent. And if we move to the next best practice, we have number six, make the information understandable for the intended audience. Yeah, now th th this one could be, could be the subject of a whole webinar, um, but, I, but I know we wanna um, uh, be uh, concise here. So there's a lot to unpack with making information understandable from uh, what readability level your information is targeting or, 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 or is measured at, uh, to what uh, kind of tone and voice is used, which has a big impact on how understandable information is. So in other words, you might be aiming your information for a reading readability grade level of grade six to eight, which is a good zone to be aiming for with public legal information. Um, the research on re readability levels is that if you want to have a significant chunk of the population able to um, understand and engage with your information, that grade six to eight range is a good range to be, to be aiming for. Um, but it's not just about the readability level. There are, are other aspects of information, like how it's organized uh, and your use of visuals that significantly play into how understandable it is. So why don't we look at an, an example here. And this is a, a guide on preparing for a refugee hearing from Kinbrace. And this is a really outstanding public legal education resource where on this page from the guide on your hearing day, they've done a number of things that I think really uh, help with making information understandable for the intended audience. They've focused on the audience, you know, your hearing day. They've taken a user perspective throughout. So your hearing day is the central event, uh, et cetera. Uh, they're using lots of great plain language techniques like using short sentences and a conversational tone uh, and uh, an active voice. So instead of saying the hearing is central, uh, the central event in the refugee claim process for the applicant, let's say they've said your hearing is the central event of your refugee claim process, which not only makes it active, but also in putting it into the U, they're directly including the reader, which is much more likely to result in people engaging with the information and feel like it's speaking to them. So a really lovely job uh, with this example, uh, including the use of visuals, uh, which significantly contribute to making information more understandable, as we'll talk about in the next best practice. Yeah, no, that's such a, it is such a great example. Thank you, Drew. And that next practice is the make the design clean, engaging, and easy to use. So what can you tell us about this? Yeah, so there's, there's a, a, a lot of interplay between making information understandable on the one hand and clean design on the other. There's, they're not like totally separate zones. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to highlight here is the degree to which uh, clean, engaging design doesn't have to be uh, something that feels like you can only get there if you spend a lot of uh, effort on a high-end designer. Um, for example, there is increasing number of tools available now that allow people with um, a good eye, but not necessarily you know, deep design training to create some very engaging, uh, clean design. Um, 
so that's, I think, one of the points to, to highlight around, around this best practice. Um, but I wanted to bring up uh, the example here. I think we've got uh, Legal Aid BC does a lovely job with their printed booklets uh, with a number of the, the, the features that help contribute to a clean design, such as uh, using headings generously and bolding key terms, which help people in scanning information and using white space. And whether you're doing a printed uh, booklet or fact sheet or a web page, white space, the research shows uh, like a 50-50 ratio is actually an optimal ratio to be aiming for in terms of being easy on the eye and helping uh, pe people uh, sort of calm people uh, and not overwhelm them with like the wall of words, for example. It's been interesting. Thank you, Drew. And now we're at the eighth of the best practice. So the best high-end best practices. So refer to free or low-cost legal help. Yeah. So no surprise to to anyone that many people may want one-on-one -on -one help with their problem, and uh, there are a number of good supports for people to get one-on-one -on -one help um, with either advice or or um, some slightly deeper assistance in in some cases. Uh, and so to highlight those options, but not a lot of them, um, that's, that's a key thing that we've discovered um, over the years uh, at, in our work at People's Law School. And I wanna show you an example here from our People's Law School website, where we focus on everyday legal problems. And here on, on the page, as one example, the page dealing with facing foreclosure, uh, we've offered uh, uh, under who can help uh, a resource, the Credit Counseling Society uh, to help with the finances. And then a link to a page where we uh, distill the top options for legal help with options like the law referral service, broadly available to British Columbians, access pro bono clinics uh, for folks with limited means to get free legal advice and, and a handful of others, but not not a dizzying array, because that can make people feel overwhelmed and get into that, that um, challenge of, of choice uh, amongst uh, a wide array of options. Yeah, so it's, it's a recurring theme, isn't it? Making sure the information is curated and presented in a way that it's useful information, it's, it's, not, it's not going to overwhelm. Um, so thank you, Drew. Those are the eight high impact, high impact best practices, and we'll be looking at each of those again in the workshop. Um, can you tell us a bit about these eight um, additional best practices? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, all of them are important. Um, some of these additional practices strengthen the process of putting together quality legal information. So dig deeper on some of the points that are covered in that more end user facing high impact set that we've covered in detail. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, number 12 on editing your language for clarity and simplicity goes into more detail on tips and techniques for presenting information in plain language and making it more understandable. Um, testing, I think, is a huge one and one that I've seen a shift over the last number of years where user testing, there is a pocket of time with especially digital information going back a few years now, still is still present. but especially a couple of years ago, a sense that that was, on, that was only the province of experts and that doing user testing yourself was too difficult. And again, similar to what I was saying about the design tools, there are tools and approaches to do online user testing at a low cost uh, yourself that you can learn a ton from. And a critical point with user testing is that you only have to test with five or six people to reveal most of the themes with your information in terms of whether it's hitting the mark for your audience. So you don't need to do testing with 20. I mentioned 20 earlier. That was because we were doing different formulations and wanted to gain insight across a wide array of, of best practices. But generally, five to six uh, testers will reveal most of the problems or, or issues that you want to address and making your information more understandable and impactful. And then to wrap up, a, a few of the other uh, additional practices here um, help you uh, really deepen the, uh, 
the impact of your information in terms of making it um, more likely to be used, uh, more accessible, uh, and, and more impactful. So the, as an example, the um, number 14 on considering how information makes your audience feels gets into the empathy aspects of developing information. I thought the, the example we looked at from Kim Brace on the refugee claim to the lovely job with this is really putting the, the audience front and center and, and conveying that what that experience is like, which greatly increases the degree to which folks will engage with information and take something away from it. And then accessibility, um, super important to be paying attention to how you can make your information more accessible. And that's uh, another one of the best practices here as well. Super. Thank you so much, Drew. I mean, it's so interesting talking about all these different ways that you can make your information have impact. And I really um, appreciate that point about um, the user testing, that it doesn't need to be expensive. It doesn't need, you don't need to test hundreds of people that you can, you can really gain a lot of traction by, by looking at five or six individuals. Um, so Drew, we're going to transition into our live Q&A. So I'm actually just going to stop my screen share and I'm going to bring up uh, the questions. So the first question that I have for you, Drew, is how will a user of the information know that the quality, oh, and um, Patricia's joining us as well. Sorry, hi Patricia, so you're back, you're back in our world. Um, how will a user of information know that the quality mark is up to date vis-a-vis -vis the information shared? So I think that the idea, the, the question is getting at here is uh, how current, if, if you assess your quality mark now, uh, sorry, your information now against the quality mark, what does that look like in a year or two? Um, would that be your take, Paula, on how, what the question is getting at? How will the user know that the quality mark is up to date? Um, I think so. I think it's, it's sort of the currency of the mark itself. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the mark doesn't have a date on it. The committee actually uh, overseeing this work spent quite a bit of time digging into whether or not to include a date on the mark and in the end decided not to at this point. It is something though that um, you know, we, we, we want to be keeping an eye on over, over time. But one of the best practices, as, as we saw in the, just the previous screen there, the additional practices, is reviewing your information um, on, on a regular basis. And this is such a critical part with public legal information, is, is it's not just doing it once and letting it go and never turning back to it, but having some kind of approach that is uh, going to allow you to keep your information refreshed. Now, it's not feasible. In, in a space where uh, many of the folks involved in this work are working at nonprofits with not um, deep, deep resources. Um, it's not feasible to be doing uh, updates every week or every month even, but to have some kind of system in place that is going to allow your, your information to be reasonably current. So um, whether it's review information every two years or four years, um, that is the kind of practice that that particular best practice um, on reviewing your information is getting at that is trying to address this point around um, keeping information uh, reasonably current over time. Yeah, and I and imagine that the with one of the best practices being um, the date of currency that that would be um, clear to to to, to somebody looking at information that was bearing the, the quality mark, that it did have its date on it. So, so hopefully that would be an indicator to members of the public exactly. as to the currency of that particular piece of information. Thank you, Paul. That's actually the better answer. Yeah. Well, well I, I think your answer was lovely. I just um, thought I'd chime in a little bit with that piece. Um, we have another one, um, Drew. Uh, how will a user, oh, sorry. Um, if we have PLI materials developed in BC, and adapted to other provinces, and the materials meet the quality mark uh, made for BC, would it be appropriate to put the quality mark on the other provinces, publications, and materials? Oh, wow. 
Um, and then we have clarification. That is, do other provinces have their own quality mark or will they honor BC's quality mark? Yeah, th this, this is all brand new. Like today is literally the launch day for this quality mark. Um, I know the folks in Ontario have been very curious to see how this would unfold for us because they, they've been um, mulling this over. I'm not sure if they would phrase it exactly this, that way, but the idea of some kind of marker or, or, or um, uh, indicator, visual indicator on information, but they've not done that in Ontario yet. And it's not been done to my knowledge in, in any other province. Um, and, and this is a, a question that we'll, we'll need to tackle is the one that Lauren has asked around the, the sort of twist of material developed in BC that Families Change website from Justice Education would be a good example where they've, they originally developed for British Columbia, but now have adapted it with other agencies across Canada for other jurisdictions. So we will need to turn our mind to that. Um, it's a good problem to have if there's an interest in, in using the quality mark to that level. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then we have another question. How do you approach dealing with English as a second language, sorry, English as second language groups? Oh dear, so my question jumped. Um, in delivering legal information, our multicultural community is growing and making the challenge of communicating effectively more challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, such, such a great question. And, and, and indeed a, a, a real challenge with, with legal information, any information really, but legal information where um, the accuracy of the information is so critical. Um, there's some really interesting um, discussion and research around use of tools like Google Translate and are they accurate enough uh, yet to be using in legal information, something certainly we've been following closely at People's Law School and um, not gone down that path to this point because we don't think it is, is ready quite for, for legal information, even though it's tantalizing. Um, but one of the things that we see, uh, we being the committees actually discussed this uh, around um, a next stage, future stages of work is this very point of, of multilingual legal information and some of the challenges around that. Um, to this point, we, we haven't dug deep on that. Um, one of the groups that we involved in our user testing though, of the, the best practices and the self-assessment uh, was Mosaic and uh, was um, really helpful to, to gain insight into um, some of the things that we incorporated to this point, but areas we could go further as the best practices continue to evolve. Thank you so much, Drew. So we're near uh, four o'clock, so I'm just going to do one last question before we, before we um, conclude this part of the webinar. Um, and there are a couple of questions about um, access to information, so I'll read, I'll read the first. Um, what resources can you recommend to learn how to improve accessibility of legal information resources? Oh yeah, Alana, awesome question. Uh, Alana from uh, West Coast Leaf was uh, also one of the testers of our self-assessment and um, great, great question about accessibility. Um, one, one um, uh, two, two thoughts here. Uh, one is that we, we're planning to de develop learning modules on s best practices where folks want more support and we've got one on plain language that we'll be releasing on the Better Legal Information website within the next week. So stay, into, stay tuned for that. And we've got a follow-up survey from this webinar where we ask what other areas, what other best practices would you like further learning support on and accessibility is on that, on that question. And so absolutely wanna hear from folks about uh, where that one fits. Um, one of the things the other part of the answer is one of the, the things that we're um, experimenting with at People's Law School is a, a resource called Equal Web, Equal Web, and it offers a, an accessibility set of tools and plugins for, um, for websites and um, quite in, intrigued about whether or not they could help make our legal information more accessible. Um, and then in the best practice itself on the Better Legal Information site for accessibility, we have links to some of the uh, web content accessibility 
guidelines supports that are good starting points for uh, implementing um, accessibility improvements on your legal information. And then Chris has got a lovely uh, comment there about Alzheimer's Society with some good resources on language and accessibility. Thanks, Krista, for that. Super. Thank you so much, Drew, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for your questions. Um, now, I'm going to go back into uh, my shared screen. Um, just to show a few resources um, and to thank everybody for joining us today. So this is really concluding the first, uh, the, the substantive, well, there will be more substance to follow, but this includes the main portion of our webinar, introducing the best practices, introducing the quality mark. So thank you so much, Drew, for walking us through this. Um, thank you so much, Patricia, for joining us. And thank you to all attendees who have been with us so far.